On the cross, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did God really abandon Jesus on the cross? Or was Jesus doing something very Jewish with these words and we've misunderstood them because we didn't understand the context? Well, we wouldn't be talking about this passage in a series called Out of Context if that wasn't the case. And this is a passage we need to understand really well. Well, friends, we've arrived at part six, the last episode in our series, Out of Context. And this particular teaching we are releasing during Holy Week because on Good Friday, these words of Jesus from the cross are usually remembered. Recorded in Matthew 27, 46, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, there's all sorts of theology that has been derived from this passage, and it generally goes something like this, that because Jesus was taking on the sin of humanity for all of human history, past, present, and future, that the sin was so great that there came a point where God actually had to turn his face away from Jesus, that he abandoned Jesus on the cross, and therefore Jesus says these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, that theology is only derived from this passage. There is no other passage in Scripture that speaks to God abandoning Jesus, which begs the question, is this how we're supposed to understand what's happening on the cross? And I want to challenge you to think differently about how this has been traditionally understood in light of what we're gonna discuss in this teaching because we need to begin with three critical observations about the traditional way of looking at this passage of what Jesus says on the cross. The first is this, that theologically, it's problematic. It's problematic for a number of reasons, but Paul captures it well in Philippians 2, five through seven, when he says, to the Philippian followers of Jesus, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, meaning Jesus was divine, Jesus was God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, mean, means to be used to his own advantage. But Paul says, but emptied himself. This is the Greek word kenosis, which means that he has set aside his divine traits or his divine qualities to be leveraged in human existence. So all this to say, Paul in a very brilliant and much you know, quicker way than what I can say it, says Jesus was God, but he did not leverage his divine qualities in his human experience. Uh, this is why, by the way, at his baptism, when the Holy Spirit shows up descending like a dove, that this is so critical to the conversation because prior to this moment, Jesus doesn't do anything of significance. He doesn't heal anybody. He doesn't do any prophetic words. And then the Holy Spirit shows up and then Jesus goes on and starts healing people and having prophecy and doing all of these teachings. Now, Jesus had the Holy Spirit before his baptism, but the idea was the presence of the Holy Spirit was there to symbolize that he was now going to be empowered to do things that was only done in the power of the Holy Spirit, i.e. when he is healing, when he is prophesying. He's not leveraging his divine qualities in this moment. The Holy Spirit is enabling him to do that. And so this is why if Jesus never ceased being God and we say that on the cross, God forsake Jesus, abandoned him, then the question you have to wrestle with is how can God abandon God? You have to wrestle with that if you're going to make that statement. Secondly, Jesus never addressed his father as God. Not once when Jesus is speaking to the father does he use anything other than father. Now, he uses God all over the place when he is telling stories and he's, you know, quoting Hebrew scriptures or things like that. But whenever Jesus addresses his father, he never says anything but father. And yet we have Jesus recorded on the cross saying, my God, my God. And the question becomes, why the aberration? 
Well, it's because the third observation is it's actually a direct quote from Scripture. Notice Psalm 22 and how it begins in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus on the cross is quoting Psalm 22. Now, it's not just a quote. It's what we also refer to as a remez. And a remez is a Hebrew word that means hint. And here's kind of a definition, a working definition for us. Remez is the practice of mentioning a key word or phrase that would hint at a passage from the Hebrew scriptures with the assumption that the audience would know its broader meaning and context and then import that context into the current teaching moment. Meaning, if you said a key word or phrase that you knew your audience would go, oh, that is a reference to this Hebrew scripture passage, they would know the context of that passage and bring it into the present moment. Okay, it's just like whenever you quote a movie line. You do so in the midst of conversation because your audience, your hearers, know the reference you're making, and typically it's to bring a laugh into the conversation because they know the original context, you're bringing that into the present context, and everybody's like, that's brilliant, that's hilarious, that's funny, that's remes. Now, as my good friend, Dr. Randall Smith, or Randy, my good friend Randy always says, any portion of a portion is the same as the whole portion, meaning, if Jesus references Psalm 22, we need to take all of Psalm 22 into consideration because it wasn't until roughly the Middle Ages that we have chapters and it's not to the middle of the 16th century that we have verses. So to have chapters and verses like we know it, that was not the case. You would take the whole portion of scripture into consideration. And so not only is this a death text that harkens us back to Psalm 22, this actually may also be a death text. Now, we don't know this for certain. That's why I have this as a question mark here. But here's what we know is that throughout history, not all Jews, but many Jews choose a passage of scripture to have on their lips at the point of death uh, if they're able to do that. Uh, we see all the way back with Rabbi Akiva in the early part of the second century AD that as he is being killed, he's actually proclaiming words of scripture. And so whether it's a death text or not, we don't know, but here's what we do know, that there are a significant amount of connections to what Jesus is experiencing on the cross with what is referenced in Psalm 22 and what Jesus is doing is grabbing onto these words because he's living in the midst of the experience. And the parallels are absolutely fascinating. And so here's what I wanna do, is I want to read to you all of Psalm 22. And I wanna pause along the way and just read from the screen passages in connection to what we are hearing in Psalm 22 that are connecting to Jesus' experience that is recorded in the Gospels. Now I'm gonna have one passage that's coming from Isaiah 53, the suffering servant passage, but the rest of them are gonna be coming from the Gospel passages. So listen to these words, listen to these connections, and then we'll draw together some fascinating conclusions as we are celebrating Holy Week, as we are seeking to better understand Jesus' words from the cross. So here we go. Psalm 22.1 is a Psalm of David, and it goes like this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. Here's that Isaiah 53, three. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Verse seven, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Matthew 27, in the same way the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him, 
He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Verse nine, yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breasts. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, many strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. John 19, later knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Last part of verse 15, you lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Right, we have this reference to crucifixion, that you would be pierced at the wrists and the feet. And then it continues. Verse 17, all my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Matthew 27, the second part of 35, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. And then it goes on, verse 19, but you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. Now, let me just pause for a quick moment. The way the Psalms go is that you have these laments. It's like, this is what's going on. This is hard, this is difficult. But in so many of the Psalms, you have this moment that turns that moves towards this movement of encouragement and hopefulness. And notice how at this moment, what goes through the rest of Psalm 22. I, verse 22, will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will bow down before him for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Now, what's fascinating about this very last line of Psalm 22 is that it's just one word in Hebrew. It's the word asa, and it can be translated as he has done it, or just as literally you can translate it as it is finished how John records Jesus' last words when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Here is what we have in Matthew, Mark, and John because Matthew and Mark, Mark is almost verbatim to Matthew's version of Jesus saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew and Mark record the very first line of Psalm 22. John records Jesus saying the last line of Psalm 22. And as my friend Randy Smith says, a portion of a portion is the whole portion. Jesus either just referenced the beginning and the end of Psalm 22, or more likely, 
Jesus recited all of Psalm 22 on the cross. And when Matthew and Mark and John are recording this, they just include one part of what Jesus said because the audience understands that a portion of a portion is the entire thing. And Jesus either said the entire thing or he was drawing their attention to the entire thing. Now, isn't that astounding? Now, some of you are going, okay, but what about Luke? Okay, well, let me just show you real quick Luke, and then we're going to go back to what Matthew, Mark, and John have done. Luke records Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Guess what? This is also a direct quote, and it's to Psalm 31, 6, where the writer, who is also David, says, Into your hand I entrust my spirit. You redeem me, O Lord, faithful God. When Jesus gives up his spirit, he's like, I'm entrusting it to you. You are faithful. Bring me back. And when you're looking at this on your own time, read all of Psalm 31 because a portion of a portion is the entire portion. And it's an explosive psalm in and of itself. So go check that out. But when we understand now what Jesus is doing on the cross, there are three things that I just want us to ponder as we conclude this episode in the midst here of Holy Week. The first thing to recognize and to ponder is this, Jesus never left the text. That Jesus read the text, he studied the text, he memorized the text, he taught the text, he lived the text, and Jesus died the text. If the living God of the universe is that intent on the text in human form, then how much more should we be consuming the very words of God for Jesus. Everything was about the biblical text. And even at his death, he is finding hope and solace in the very words of God. A second thing to consider is, let's go back to that poignant moment in Psalm 22, where the writer says and where Jesus is drawing our attention to and likely proclaim from the cross, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. I would submit to you that in Jesus' darkest hour that God did not abandon him. That there may have been some fleeting moments where maybe Jesus felt that way in the midst of heaping all the sin of all of humanity for all of history being upon him. But Jesus recognized that in his darkest hour, God did not abandon him in his time of need. And I would submit that in our darkest hour, God doesn't leave us either. That when it just feels like God left the building, when God is not present, and we just feel so abandoned. It's how we feel, but it's actually not true that God is with us in our deepest and darkest hours. And then the third thing I just want us to consider is that when Jesus received the drink according to John 19, 30, and John records for us the last words of Psalm 22, and Jesus says, it is finished. Jesus is not quoting Greek but he's being recorded in Greek. And when John has the word finished, what Jesus is using, or even this phrase, like a saw in Hebrew, which is one word and we translate it as it is finished. It's also one word here in the Greek. And it's the word tetelestai. And here's what's so cool about this word tetelestai is that in the first century, it was used as a business term, a commercial idiom for paid in full. That when Jesus is on the cross, it's not just this kind of relinquished, it is finished. It is a proclamation that Jesus shouts from the cross that it is finished, that our sins have been paid in full and that what we are reminded of in the midst of Holy Week, in the midst of resurrection season, is that Jesus went to a cross, he paid our sins in full, that we have hope both now and forevermore because Jesus was willing to go to a cross on our behalf. And this wasn't just some sick joke that God was playing on his son. This is something that the God had the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had determined from the foundations of the earth to do on our behalf. And Jesus didn't go, didn't go reluctantly. 
He went on mission to do what we could not do for ourselves because that is what the love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit looks like, that Jesus was willing to go to whatever length necessary to reconcile us to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is worth celebrating, not just in this season, but every day of our life. So friends, chew on that, wrestle with that, wallow in the amazement of what Jesus did on our behalf and what happens when we set a text in context and recognize it the way the writers of the Bible expected their audience to do so. It's powerful, it's meaningful, and it is forever unchanging. So friends, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for listening. May you walk out the text well in your life.